franchise secrets, Eric Von Horn. Hey, in this episode of Franchise Secrets, I have my good friend Dave Allred on. We got into all kinds of things from franchising to passive investing, deep into real estate, tax advantages, lifestyle design, why he uh, was, uh, why he let his 15 and a half year old daughter buy a Tesla Model 3. And it's probably not for the reasons that you think it is. Like there's a lot of lessons in how she did that, which um, I learned and I, and I love that story. Um, how he got started. I mean, he came from nothing and has built up a massive real estate portfolio. Um, and that didn't come easy as well. He's got this amazing life and he's got this desire to help other people have an amazing life as well. A great teacher, a great person, great family man. I hope you enjoy this episode with my friend, Dave. Dude, it's always fun to have friends on the podcast. Like I know things about you because we're friends. We spent time at Formula One, which you picked up the tab on that, by the way. Thanks again for that. You're right. I forgot about that. You, you, owe, you owe me. In case you, owe you forgot. I, I like my friends to owe me, you know, like to, to, <laughs> to be indebted to me. So there's truth to that. No, it's fun. Just, you know, I mean, we met, you know, years ago at a mastermind called 100 Million Mastermind Academy. And, um, and then just, you know, got to spend some time together. And then now we're both around Justin Donald. We're both in front row dads. You've done, you had a job at Vivint and really leveraged that into real estate, built up a massive passive income portfolio, leverage that into new, you've invested in franchise brands at, at the franchise or level at the franchisee level. You've done so many different things and, and we both have in common just our love for family and, um, and our desire to have lifestyle more than just a bunch more cash in the bank. So welcome to the show. Excited to be here, man. Been looking forward to this one for a long time. Let's go. Where do we want to start? You want to start with a little bit of your background? So I, I live here in Utah. Uh, I was born in a small town called Manta, Utah, population 2,000 people. Uh, I grew up in a very low income, blue collar home and uh, didn't really have much to speak of. Um, kind of a, you know, a, 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 somewhat of a, a broken home and ran away when I was 17, moved into a little, uh, you know, a little house with a roof caving in, you know, cockroaches living off of ramen noodles and, 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 and fast food, um, paying, I think it was like $220 a month in rent. Um, and, uh, you know, learned, a, learned a lot through that. And I just knew I wanted something more for my fam for myself and my future family. And I was committed to doing whatever it took. And I didn't know how I was going to break out of it, but I just knew that we were we were better than that. And you know, my little brother ran away a year later, moved in with me. So it was me and my brother, and you know, kind of a heavy responsibility. To, you know, be looking over him as well. And um, you know, I, I could tell you stories on stories on, on 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 that phase of my life. And but you know, I was really grateful for having that commitment, like burning commitment. Like I'm going to do whatever it takes to to to, to completely reset the standard, to break through from this to create, basically to reset the standard on happiness, success, impact, legacy, um, resolving trauma, you know, really creating an impact and, and, and success. And fast forward, I was going to college and there's a recruiting. Well, hold on there because like, I know some of these stories and I know like that still drives you today and you are who you are because of everything that you that you went through in your mindset and and the decisions that you made um as a as a young adult as a kid what was it like if you look back like what was it that caused you to go down this road of pursuing like personal development success knowing that you could do it versus going down the road that you could have easily gone down which you know a road uh of probably being worse off than you were growing up man that is such a good question it, it's hard to pinpoint it I, I think that mainly it was just i think it began with being so frustrated with the situation that i was in i mean it was it was very very dysfunctional and it was it, it wasn't fun man it was just it, it really was hard it was so hard and and i, and I say this actually with gratitude and this might sound weird but you know, it was so hard in the, in home in my first few phases, even into my, you know, knocking doors, kind of selling home security systems. Like I, I'm, I'm actually really grateful for that because it inspired me to 
be able to envision what it, how I wanted to change my life. And I was able to look at that situation. Like, okay, we're better than this. Like, I, I'm not okay with this. I have more potential than this. And, and, and really using that as more of a, instead of an excuse to go and, and continue to, 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 to perpetu- perpetuate that same experience in the, in, in the future, it was, okay, that didn't work. So what can I do differently in my life to be able to completely change this? And so I think that's where it began. And then from there, it, it, it went to my all-time favorite quote. I had a few posters in my bedroom as a teenager. You know, I had a, a, a poster of the Lamborghini, of course. I had a poster of, uh, I think it was Pamela Anderson, <laughs> right? Um, and I think I had Cindy Crawford on there too. I remember the little mole, you know, on the top of her, her, her lip. <laughs> hey, teenage boy, you know, I, that's like- Probably it, still have it. No, nah, but my wife probably wouldn't really be too stoked on that one. <laughs> But, and then the, the fourth poster though, was my all time favorite athlete and it was Jerry Rice. And at the bottom of the poster, it had a quote and it says, today I will do what others won't so that tomorrow I can have what others can't. And, and that, that really kind of became my, my mantra. Like, you know, I'm going to do whatever it takes today to be able to have the life others can't in the future. And it was really just embracing delayed gratification and, and doing hard things. And, uh, you know, I, but Eric, to answer your question more concisely, I don't know exactly where that came from. I've been trying to figure it out because I've got four kids now and I want them to have that same kind of determination to go out and, and win a life. But I think it's really just been, you know, my whole life's been a goal of being able to help inspire other people, create a lot of value and, and lift other people up around me. And, and really I, I get a lot of excitement and, and, and motivation from trying to be an inspiration, you know, and might sound kind of cheesy, but just trying to, no, it's good. I know it because it's true. And, and, and that's who you are, man. Well, I appreciate that. Um, and still have a ton of work to do. <laughs> I, I'm not acting like I figured it all out, but, um, you know, and we'll probably get into this, but fast forward a little bit, you know, went out and, uh, I was recruited to go sell home security systems door to door, go out to Chicago, Illinois, um, you know, crime capital. How old were you at that, at that point? So you moved out at 17. How old were you when you started working, selling security system? Yeah. So at age 19, I actually went on a two year service mission um, with a church out to Peru. So I've been in South America for two years. Uh, again, extremely hard, <laughs> heard so many life lessons out there. Um, came back from that. I was going to college and they had a recruiting booth set up with some Krispy Kreme donuts. And, uh, and they had a, a, a recruiting meeting that evening at, at a pizza restaurant. And so I'm a poor college kid. I'm like, okay, Krispy Kreme donuts, free pizza, winning, let's go. Next thing you know, I'm recruited out to Chicago, Illinois, and about knocking doors on home security systems. And I knew it was going to be very hard, right? Um, but I knew I'd learn a lot from that. And I saw that as an opportunity to be able to go ahead and get ahead in life and kind of fast track, you know, where I wanted to get to. And, but it, I had no idea how hard it was going to be. Um, you know, the first week I, I, I failed miserably at it. Um, and halfway through the summer, 80% of our team had quit and gone home. Um, I was, I was doing so poorly. I thought about quitting every day. I, I, actually, I was thought about quitting every, probably every hour, <laughs> every day. It was just nonstop. Like, hey, should I, why am I here? I'm not making money. Uh, we're not winning. This isn't going well. Um, and, and one of the, the, the owners came out. I know, I'll never forget this. And he, he had a conversation with our team and he said the remaining, I think it was five people on the team. So wait a second. One of the owners, to get more specific, one of the owners of, of what company and... Yeah, yeah. So it's a, it was a home security system. Uh, com- a company selling home security systems door to door. So a small co- was it like the like it, was it like a franchise or was it was like a small small company out there? Or when you say owner, I think is it small mom and pop or is it a large corporation? Uh, very small. So here in Utah, there's a lot of door to door sales companies, and so the company was called Pinnacle Security, um, and they were. I mean, there's probably 20, 25 different uh, door to door sales companies at that time. And they were top five, but still relatively small. Real small. So the owner of the small security system c- company came out and like pulled, pulled, pulled together the remaining twenty percent of the team. And what they like, what happened? Yeah, and he said, "Hey, listen, anybody that sells a hundred accounts can qualify to be a sales manager next year." And at that point, I think I was at like twenty-seven accounts, right? And and, and you make about you know two, three hundred dollars an account. So you can do the math on that. It wasn't very much. And and so, uh, but something flipped for me. I was like, you know, I could become a sales manager. I can create value for other people, become a leader of men. I can make more money personally. I can have this leadership career and build something really special here. And, but really it was, I, I just didn't want to quit. You know, a lot of guys tuck their tails between their legs when it gets hard. And I've always taken pride in not being a quitter. I've never quit anything in my life that was important to me. 
So I doubled down. I'm like, okay, I'm already out here. It's been two months. I got two more months in the summer before I go back to college. I'm just going to go as hard as I can at this. And I just, I doubled down. And in the next two months was really incredible. I ended up selling 121 accounts, made $31,000 total, which for me, Eric was a game changer. Like it's more than my parents ever made. You know, I came back and bought an Isuzu Rodeo with the Chrome rim package, <laughs> you know, and I was, I was balling down there going to college and, and, uh, it was a big win for me. And even to this day, right. And we're doing million dollar deals all the time and whatnot, you know, and, and looking back that $31,000 is the most important money I've made in my, in my entire life because it, it proved to me that I, you know, if I don't quit at something, I can, I can go and I can, I, I can win. And it gave me enough confidence to come back next year as a sales manager, top first year sales manager in the company made $156,000. And that was the second most important money I've ever made in my life because I'd always thought that a hundred thousand dollars would be like best case scenario. If I played my cards right, you know, and it's like did everything perfectly one day, I might be able to make a hundred thousand dollars. And so making hundred, 156,000 really broke that paradigm and that limiting belief system. And then the next year came out, made 257,000 next year, 560,000 and built this, you know, this 15 year leadership career, uh, with a, managing 121 sales teams in 41 states across the country. And, you know, but, but it's crazy looking back, like if I would have quit, like most guys had, that would have changed the entire trajectory of my life. And so I'm so grateful for not having quit when it was, when it was really hard. So I know that like you're a believer in, in door to door. And that's one of the, one of the things that you attribute to like where you are today. You didn't, you know, you just weren't spending your money on frivolous stuff when, when you started to make uh, really good money. And so Take us to that point when you wanted to start investing money and and how that kind of went about. On that comment about door to sales, though, I will say it's not an easy way to make a dollar, right? It's probably one of the hardest ways. And with that being said, though, you learn so much about so many life skills and soft skills, right? You learn about grit, determination, uh, dealing with rejection day after day, door after door, time management, self-discipline, salesmanship, which is probably the most valuable skill set, leadership arguably the maybe the sec, first or second most valuable skill set in, in in the economy and so you learn so much from that in fact my children um you know i've got four of them and no matter how much affluence or abundance we may have like they they all know they're they're required to go out and do at least one season of door to door sales because i truly believe that, like doing hard things is so important man i think the culture today is really getting away from that right um you know these kids that they, they want instant gratification it's the immediate dopamine hit they want the the whole idea of delayed gratification or the law of the harvest is it feels like i feel like that's kind of going away and in my experience in my life the best things come from that delayed gratification where you really have to pay the price and you have to really you know that law of the harvest you're planting the seeds and you're watering you're fertilizing you're putting you're toiling this the dirt you're putting so much work into it before you actually see the the results from that right so um fast forward so i made one hundred fifty six thousand dollars first year managing i go to my cpa i'm like hey what are all of your wealthy clients doing because i thought i was well <laughs> felt wealthy right and he goes they're they're all investing in either businesses or real estate and I'm like, okay, well, real estate sounds interesting. It sounds fun. Why, why did you ask that question to your CPA? Because a lot of people are going to ask that question to the C, to their CPA. Good question. It, it may have been coupled with, you know, what are all your rich clients or wealthy clients doing? And, you know, what, what's, what's, how can I mitigate my tax liability? Because I was looking at probably, you know, $30,000 $30, tax bill. And that's a great question. It's probably, it's probably a mix of that kind of tied in with it as well. And so- he says real estate, I'm like, hey, that sounds cool. I don't know anything about it. You know, we in, in, in our home, we never talked about money, finances, business, any of that. And so, like, okay, I'm going to become a student of the game. I'm going to become a student of real estate. I'm going to figure this out. So, I went to uh, Todd Peterson, the CEO of Vivint. Um, I'm like, hey, I want to learn real estate. I know you own apartment complexes. Like, help, you know, teach me the way. And I just did, committed to becoming very teachable. Um, I started listening to, you know, books, audiobooks, mentors, just being around people that were in the game of real estate. And I'm so grateful for that, Eric, because, you know, today I'm, I'm so passionate about real estate. I really do believe it's the best way to create true wealth, freedom, time, freedom, lifestyle, freedom, and, and generational wealth. And, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for that, 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 that journey beginning so long ago, that was about 20 years ago. 
And so, um, yeah, just, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. went out and I bought a, a few rental properties and had some, some big losses, some lessons learned along the way for sure. But so when you say rental properties, were they single families, were they duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes? So the first four that I purchased were, this is back in 2010 and it was right when the, you know, the housing collapse was kind of uh, coming out of that, that downturn. And there were a lot of bank owned properties. And so I took a a hundred thousand dollars of my income and I went to the courthouse and I bought a townhome for a hundred thousand dollars and then I bought three more of those. So I bought four townhomes for a hundred thousand dollars each and fast forward a few years, those had doubled in value to be worth about two hundred thousand dollars. And so what I did was it's called a 1031 exchange. It's where you can sell a property and exchange it into a like kind property and it's not there's no taxable event. And so I take one townhome, sell it use that $200,000 of equity and roll it into a, you know, a, a, a $500,000 fourplex. And that equity was a down payment. So I was able to take four townhomes and roll that forward into four fourplexes. So now I went from four doors to 16 doors with zero cash, additional cash out of pocket. Right. And then the market's been so, 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 so good that two to three years later, those fourplexes I bought for half a million were now worth 800,000. So I did the same thing. I'd sell one fourplex, 1031 exchange into three new fourplexes. So I took those three fourplexes, sorry, those four fourplexes, rolled that into basically 12 new fourplexes, again, with no cash out of pocket. So now I'm at what, 48 doors, right? And then I, long story short, I went from those four single family homes and kept continuing to roll that forward in 1031 exchanges to get up to about 60, I think it was 64 units with no additional cash out of pocket by simply rolling for the equity. I call it velocity of money. And it's paying attention to your cash on equity versus cash on cash, which is a whole kind of another. So explain that, explain cash on equity versus cash on cash. Cool. Yeah, and this is something I didn't realize until I was about maybe three years into my real estate investing journey. Cash on cash is very simple. It's taking your cash, you know, your net cash and dividing that by the amount of cash you invested originally to purchase the property. And most people just pay attention to the cash on cash. And what happens is with time and market rents going up and inflation, that number continues to get better and better and better and better. So people get very complacent with that cash on cash number. Now, what I realized though is, especially in a hot market, you know, your equity is going up every single day, every single month, every year. And that's due to two things. One is the market appreciation, naturally appreciating. And secondly, it's the principal pay down on your mortgage, right? A portion that goes towards paying down the principal. And so when you take your cash flow, your net cash flow, and you divide that by your equity in the deal, not the cash that went in originally, but the actual equity today, what happens is over time, that number, that, that, that percentage is going down, right? Because the equity is going up. And so when you take your net cash divided by your actual equity, that's called cash on equity. And as soon as that number gets below five, maybe 4%, to me, I need to go and redeploy that capital to be able to go and scale my portfolio. And that's either going to be a cash out refinance or a 1031 exchange. And Eric, that might sound like kind of a lot, but it's actually really simple. But so many people don't really understand that concept. And that really was a key for me to be able to go from, you know, four doors to 48 doors to 64 doors. And then eventually up to ownership in over a thousand doors today, right? Over 12,000. So not only just the appreciation of the asset and being able to sell the asset through 1031 or being able to refinance out of the asset to pull cash out, it's not paying taxes along the way. So you have more capital to use. So you're not spent, you're not paying the government 30%. You're able to use that, defer it. Um, it's not, it's not tax free, but it's deferred. And so you, you know, instead of having uh, $70,000, I don't know what the numbers are, you tell me, but $70,000 to, to buy something else, you have $100,000 to buy something else because you didn't give up that money to Uncle Sam. Hey, such a good point. And this is not financial advice, not tax advice, right? But uh, there is such an incredible amount of tax benefits in the United States tax code for real estate investors. And I think it's something that is very uh, misunderstood or underappreciated. You know, right now, you know, there's something called accelerated depreciation. We do what's called a cost segregation study. We can take a ton of that depreciation benefit upfront year one 
and it's incredible. And and like you said, you know what that allows me to do is if I'm making say I make a million dollars in a year, but I don't have to pay any taxes because of the depreciation benefits. I can then you know say instead of paying a quarter million dollars to the IRS and taxes, I can go and buy another fourplex. I can I can use that capital to go and scale the portfolio. And that's really been a huge wealth magnifier for me is to be able to, and, and, and it's actually deferring taxes for the most part and it's kicking the can down the road, right? But what I can do is, as long as the tax code doesn't change, it's literally, I'll continue to 1031, 1031 into bigger and bigger apartment complexes and commercial real estate and do that the rest of my life without paying any taxes. And then when I pass away with the death benefit, it's called a step up basis. My, my, my children will inherit this empire, this, you know, this portfolio of, of real estate and there's zero taxes due. It resets the, the basis uh, with the death benefit when I pass away. It's an incredible, again, it's, it might get closed. It's a huge tax benefit. So I'm not sure it'll be around, you know, you know, I'm 42. I'm going to live to at least 110, 120. So we got a long ways to go here still, but, uh, but it's pretty incredible, man. And, you know, I could talk all day on taxes and, it's not something that uh, is fun to, to really talk about, but at the end of the day, it is the largest transfer of wealth in our lives. And it's really not about what you make, it's about what you keep. So if you're listening to this, you want to know more about taxes and the tax you know, deferral, savings, et cetera. I did a podcast with Tom Wheelwright. So check out the podcast I did with Tom Wheelwright. He's amazing at that stuff. He's Rich Dad's you know, kind of tax advisor. Yeah, Tom Wheelwright's incredible. I actually just did a social media post on uh, Instagram about that. I finished the book, his new book, last week. It was really, really well done. Highly recommend it. Talks about uh, six different investments that the government wants you to be investing in, and therefore they incentivize you with tax benefits for investing in those those sectors. Um, and, and let me just say one more thing. What I've learned over the last you know two decades of investing in real estate is there's four ways we make money in real estate. And the first one is cash flow, which is by far my favorite mailbox money, right? Complete passive. Number two is, is natural market appreciation, right? Just by owning the property, historically, it's been about a 4% appreciation rate per year. The last uh, you know five years has been closer to 16% uh, across the nation. The third way to make money is depreciation, which is all those tax benefits we just talked about. And the fourth way is principal reduction. So it's the ability to uh, pay down that that principal every single month, and it's your tenants that are actually paying that through the rent, right? And I'd actually add a fifth um, benefit to real estate, which is is uh, is leverage, right? The ability to take one of your dollars and three dollars from the bank or a lender or current or current uh, owner. Yeah, well, you said owner didn't you? Yeah, but the crazy part is though. So you know, you get the leverage of you know, say three to one, right, from the lender or the bank but you still get the full appreciation value in the market of the entire asset. You get the depreciation of the entire hundred percent of the value of the asset and the cash flow from the entire asset. And so there's so much to talk about because and we're going to shift gears into franchise and then we're going to shift gears into uh, Axia partners. You're, you're fun. Um, but I'll say this as kind of, we wrap up this um, we all, you know, you're in a mastermind with Justin. I have a mastermind with Justin called tribe of investors. We just had, Raj Gupta, who, you know, he's a front row dads and does a lot of real estate stuff as well. He was in there just talking about, you know, different ways to save on taxes using real estate, bonus depreciation, um, um, uh, opportunity zones, all kinds of, all kinds of different ways to do it. Qualified real estate professional. And the people were just loving that, that time with him because all of a sudden, it's not a painful thing to talk about taxes. It's a great thing because there's ways to mitigate it. And I love Tom Wheelwright's frame of it. Like the government incentivizes this stuff. They want you to have tax savings. They act like they don't and, you know, whatever it is, but they incentivize tax savings. You just need to know what they're incentivizing so you know where to invest your money. And, and uh, so I love Tom's frame on that. And you had a great post on that as well. Go ahead. I was going to mention one of my goals a long time ago was to basically create a tax deductible lifestyle. And what that means to me is it's, it's, it's realizing how can you incorporate your lifestyle, right? What you're passionate about, you know, your family, travel, et cetera, into your businesses. And there's a lot of really interesting ways to do that. Um, a few quick examples, you know, so I've got, you know, call it six or seven different businesses and, you know, I have my, my vehicles or my business vehicles. I, um, 
you know, as I, I, all my children are my employees. They, I pay them on a salary and, you know, I think kids learn best through participation versus just teaching and telling them. So they're all employees in my real estate uh, firm, and which, uh, which is such a fun thing as a dad, man, to be able to teach your kids. And it's not just about money, but it's how to be responsible with it and how to give back and, you know, create the already family foundation. And so all my children get to choose their own uh, charitable organizations to support. And then they put a portion of their salaries, or their earnings into our family foundation. And, but they have the autonomy to choose how they deploy that capital with those organizations. It's been really, really fun. Um, but, 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 you know, for another example is I, I love travel. And so, you know, we just built a second home down in St. George, one in Park City, building one in Scottsdale, Vegas, and San Diego, because those are five markets we love traveling to. And so those are all Airbnbs that are short-term rentals, but they're also a second home for me and my family. So I can take my children, my partners, my investors, my friends, and go have great experiences there and utilize those, those, those properties. It's actually a tax deduction because I'm going to be, while I'm there, I'm going to look at the property, do a, you know, maintenance and, and make sure everything's working properly. So the trips, a tax deduction, the mortgage, the interest, all the utilities, all of that, but I still have to create these incredible experiences for people I care about. Attention, franchisors and franchisees. There are two really important resources that I want to share with you that will help you avoid costly mistakes and increase your enterprise value. The first is our free Facebook group. It's a community that has over 4,000 franchisees and franchisors in it. When somebody asks a question, they get honest and authentic answers from multiple perspectives. You can join the group for free over at franchisesecrets.com forward slash Facebook. The second resource I wanna share with you is if you're a franchisor and you're frustrated that you're not awarding as many franchises as you thought you would, this is the reason I created the Franchisor Mastermind. If you want access to the information, the techniques that the best franchise sales organizations are using to award franchises, and you want what mature brands have with their playbook of having happy, successful franchisees that grow the right way, then you might wanna check out the Franchisor Mastermind. The reason why people join is they want access to my Rolodex, my connections. They want the playbook to achieve both short-term and long-term success. They wanna increase enterprise value in their brand. Links will be in the show notes or at scalablefranchise.com. Can we take a quick tangent? And um, can you share the story about uh, your your daughter's car, how she got her car? <laughs> sure, I'd be happy to. Because I, I think the context is it shows kind of how intentionally you are about like your kids just don't get everything that they want and like it just shows intentionality around parenting and whatnot because you have substantial wealth but you're not trying to just you know destroy your kids with wealth so that's the context and that's why i think that one of the scariest things is is to create you know a really comfortable situation for children um you know the rockefeller study it's really interesting where usually what they found is that you know when one uh family has created a lot of wealth and abundance Usually their children are okay. It's actually that second generation that gets really, really soft and they, they, they have a really hard time. Um, and so what kind of the motto in, in our home is, you know, nothing is given, everything is earned. And so with my daughter, you know, she, when she was 14, she went out and got a, a job at Riverside Country Club. And then she's worked at my, my Everbowl franchise location here in Utah. And so she's been very industrious and work, hard worker, and she's been investing that money into you know some cryptocurrency and some stocks like Lululemon and um, some some of the stocks that she likes, Tesla, and uh, and then also um, into some real estate. So she actually has been uh, partnering with me on some of these smaller real estate deals. And so she came to me when she was 15 and a half, and she's like, "Hey, Dad, I really want a Tesla Model Three for my 16th birthday for my first car," and I'm like hell no, <laughs> we're not going to do that. Right? Like that's completely responsible. How does that make sense? You know, but she was very persistent and she just kept coming at me like, Hey dad, like I really want, you know, this car. I think it'd be awesome for this reason, this reason, this reason. And by the way, you know, one thing that's uh, teaching your children to be good salespeople, it's a double-edged sword. <laughs> like, like they end up, you know, using that against you and, you know, you love these kids and you want the best for them and be happy. And so it's really hard. You know, but man, my daughter, she is just relentless and she, you know, I've taught her that no means yes. And so it's like literally, okay, no, all right, cool. So I take a different approach on this. I mean, uh, you know, 
I'm not a dog. I'm not a pet person. Um, but now we have a dog, we have a cat and she has a Tesla model three, which we're going to come back to. But the point being is, you know, you teach these kids salesmanship and it, it does kind of come back to bite you sometimes, but I'm really proud of her. So what happened was after, you know, saying no so many times, I thought about it. I'm like, you know what? That's actually not the right answer. The right answer is, you know, you can have anything you want in life, but the key, the, the, the quality question is how can I create enough passive recurring income to be able to have these discretionary or these depreciating things in my life that I want, right? Whether that's a new Breitling watch or a new car or a wakeboarding boat or a new razor, whatever that looks like. And so I went back to my, okay, you know what? Okay, this car payment is going to be $350 a month. So let's figure out how you can get enough recurring passive income to be able to afford what you want. And so what we ended up doing was selling off her Ethereum and Bitcoin and selling some of those stocks and liquidating that. And then she came in on a JV joint venture partnership with me on a, a duplex that I own here in Utah. And so she came in and we literally did a formal JV agreement with her. And now every month she's earning about call it $300 of reoccurring passive income from that investment. And then I also said, Hey, your mom's, you know, she's always com- kind of, you know, complaining about driving you guys around all your sporting events and, and, uh, you know, uh, all the, all, all the sports activities that my kids are in. And so I'll pay you your a salary to go and be like basically an Uber driver for mom. Win, win, win situation. Right. So now she's making call it $400 a month. She's easily covering her car payment. And the beautiful thing is she still has all of her equity in the real estate, which is appreciating. So she's not taking away from that, that nest egg. It's still growing and she gets passive income and now she has a Tesla. And I just love, I love being able to teach the kids that, right? Like if any of my kids came in, even my eight year old right now, and I'd I'd say, Hey, Hey, what's, what's the best type of income? They would say passive income. Like they, they know this stuff. And it's been really fun for me as a dad to be able to kind of, you know, teach them and get them prepared for the real world. I love it, man. I love that story. You told me that a while ago. I'm like, as you were talking, I'm like, you have to tell that story. So I think that'll help a lot of, a lot of parents out there to know kind of how to frame things when they're, when their kids want something. I mean, you could just turn it right back on them, especially if they don't know sales very well and get them to think differently. Heck, some of these adults probably need to think differently about some of this stuff. On that point is, you know, it's, it's actually not the kid's fault. It's, it's a travesty, in my opinion, that our public school systems do no, they teach nothing about personal finance, the tax code, about how to balance a checkbook, about compound interest, about, you know, tax deductions. There's zero formal training in our school system for the youth and You know, don't get me going on a rabbit hole, but I think that's by design because, you know, that financial literacy creates financial independence and free agency. And maybe that's not what, you know, big brother (laughs) wants for us. But I mean, so, so it's not, what I will say is, you know, if, if this stuff's kind of over your head or your, your kid's head, it's actually not your fault. However, your future is your responsibility, right? So I think it's important just to take responsibility for that and accountability to be able to, you know, change that going forward. It will be your fault now. Moving forward, after hearing this, it will be your fault. Up to this point, no. What, what books or, th- I mean, I had Robert Kiyosaki on the podcast and he's like, I did Rich Dad, Poor Dad because I wanted to teach the general public about accounting and how to read a financial statement. So any kind of books or podcasts or anything that you would recommend, I'd follow you. So let people know how to follow you, but anything else that you would recommend for someone that's like, this is interesting, but I don't know where to start. Yeah. I probably just ask you to distinguish like which category like leadership or, uh, you know, scaling a business or personal development or investing or real estate. I just did a, a, a business insider article that was published last month and I listed out my top seven books and why in each one of those different categories. So if you go onto my Instagram or um, Facebook, you can, you can dig that up. Um, I think that Robert Kiyosaki has been, you know, probably the most, probably the biggest thought leader in, in real estate in terms of change that mindset, you know, from an employee to a business owner, to an investor. Um, when I was, I was actually out in St. Louis and I was grabbing dinner with Ed Milet and Andy Frisella. And, uh, we were talking about a few things and, 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 and Ed said something really interesting. He said, Dave, the only difference between where you are today and where you're going to be you know, 12 months from now is three things. It's the books you read, it's the podcasts you listen to, and the people you spend your discretionary time with. 
And when I heard that, I'm like, okay, I get that. You know, it's pretty straightforward. You know, you are the hours of five people you spend your time with. But the more I've thought about that, Eric, it really makes sense, man. Like the, it's, it's basically what you ingest, right? It's what you, it's your environment, it's the people you're around, it's the content that you, you're digesting. And so for me, one, one, one best practice is anytime I'm in my vehicle driving anywhere, you know, I just listen, I never listen to music and I love listening to music. Um, but I, I, it's, it's just a hard no. It's a, it's a, it's a commitment that I made. And so it's always an audio book and I try to get through at least one audio book every two weeks. Right. Um, I, you know, readers are leaders. And I just think that's really important. That we're always feeding ourselves like that. Um, on the books, uh, one book I'd read, you know what, that's, that's a big question. I could go along pretty long on that one. Um, do you need to go get his list? How do they find your list? Where do they find you on social? So just jump on, uh, it's just Dave Allred. Uh, pretty straightforward. Dave Allred should be pretty easy to find on any of the social platforms. Um, also, I just uh, launched a website and it's DaveAllred.com. And I've got that article posted on there as well. Um, also, uh, there's a template I have on there. It's called Lifestyle Design. And it's something I'm really proud of. It's a system I've, I've, I've been working on for the last 15 years. And it's basically just, uh, you know, it's 10 areas in my life that I want to be great at. Um, you know, fitness, time, health, family, investments, business, spiritual experiences, relationships, et cetera, personal growth. And so I've got this template and it's a free download. If anybody wants to check it out, um, I share it freely. But for me, it's been one of the biggest um, benefactors in my life. It's really helped give me purpose and direction and, and clarity on and intentionality in how I want to live my life and and how, how, how I would define a life well lived with no regrets. And so if that sounds valuable, uh, you're welcome to jump on there. It's a free download. It's a great download. You should all check it out, DaveAllred.com. All right, let's shift gears. Let's spend a little bit of time on the investments that you've done into franchise ors and franchisees, just passive as a passive investor. Then I want to spend some time talking about some of the things that you're doing um, with Axia Partners, which is a you know an investment that I'm personally involved with. And there's some unique things. It's also something that we've given to um, the mastermind but we get some privileges because of what we've done at the mastermind. The members get some privileges. So I want to dive into that as well, but let's talk about, let's start with the franchising side of things, passive investor in franchisees and franchisors. Like give me some of your thoughts. Like why did you invest into uh, the brands that you've invested into and why at the franchisee level and why at the franchisor level? So I want to preface this by saying I don't have, a ton of experience in that. I'm definitely more of a real estate guy. And the reason why that's the case, and and, and I'll say this it, with the spirit of creating value for your listener base, because um, everybody's attracted to different type of investments. And, there, and there's not necessarily a right or a wrong. I think the key to smart investing is 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 approaching it with intentionality, right? It's not, it's not investing because of FOMO or because you're excited or you're scared of missing out or you know, fear and greed really move uh, human nature, and especially in investing, is based on fear and greed for most people. I believe that the higher the emotion, the lower the intelligence, right? Higher the emotion, the lower the intelligence. So especially when it comes to investing. So I, my goal is to take out the emotion completely and, and be investing based on, you know, what really gets me where I want to go? What creates the freedom that I'm looking for? What creates you know, what, what's the end goal that I'm really trying to achieve through this investment? And so with that being said, you know, I learned a long time ago that I, I hate losing more than I love winning. <laughs> and so when I look at my investments, I really approach it with like, Hey, how, how do I not lose? Uh, you know, and Warren Buffett says it best. He says, there's two rules to investing. Rule number one, don't lose your money. Rule number two, don't forget rule number one. Like, you know, when you lose, it really is, you know, one foot, one step forward, two steps backwards. And so I love real estate because. So hold on before real estate. Have you lost money being an investor? I have, but it's still, and I think that's important because some people think, oh, Dave said, or Eric hates losing money. And that's really important to love, um, uh, to hate losing more than you love winning, but as passive investors, like we've lost money before and, and there's ways to mitigate the risk and whatnot. But I just want to like, there's people out there that 
are like, I've lost some money or didn't go up as fast as I wanted to, or this is really challenging. I may lose money. I may lose a lot of money. And they start to to think probably should be investing, probably should just put it in the stock market, not do real estate, not do, not join a, a, a fund or, you know, a, a, um, private deals or whatever it is because they've lost money. It doesn't just because you've lost money doesn't mean you're a bad investor. It might, but that's does that those two are not synonymous. I don't think. What what do you think about that? I, I first of all, I love the question, man. I'm glad you brought that up. I think that I have a few thoughts. I'll go quick here. Uh, first off, I am very proud that I've never lost a single dollar of investor money in any real estate deals I've ever done in the last in my life, in the last 15 years specifically. So I'm really proud of that. With that being said. I think that um, the key when you do lose is to look at it as a learning opportunity. And there's so much that comes from that. I, I believe that there's two types of people in this world. There are spectators and there's participants. And for me, I always want to be a participant, man. I, I learn more by putting my, my, my you know, foot in the water and actually diving in than sitting on the sidelines and, and, and watching other people do what they're doing. You know, so many people back in, I mean, 2017, 18, like, hey, I'm not going to get in the real estate market because I'm going to wait until once there's a big correction or the market drops. Real estate prices have literally doubled since 2007, uh, you know, depending on the market you're in, but they've gone up dramatically, right? And a huge missed opportunity. So I would rather be in the game and, and, and learn from that. I feel like, and I've invested across the board in pretty much everything. And I've done almost 200 investments that have gone full cycle. And one thing that's really helped me to, I call it, you, to, to, to learn my own investor DNA. What that means is everybody has their own strengths and their own weaknesses, their own blind spots in how we approach life and investing. And so for, it's really important to identify where your blind spots are and where your strengths are when you approach your investments. One thing that's helped me out tr um, tremendously is I keep a spreadsheet and it's uh, an investment tracker. And so I have every investment, the name of the investment, the amount invested, the return on the investment, and then I actually score at one through 10, 10 being the best. And then I break that down by category so I can see that, you know, my, my, my commercial real estate has been the top performer. Second best has been my hard money loans, right? Third best is, you know, whatever else. Stock market towards the very bottom. Um, but, but, but that gives me a lot of data on where I've done the best and where I should continue to be investing. But the best part about that spreadsheet is on the far right, there's a column and it says, lessons learned and on every single deal when, once it's closed out it's gone full cycle i write down what went wrong or what went well so if you know if it went badly like okay i should have done my due diligence better i should have gotten a personal guarantee i should have had a, a, an attorney draft the, the documents for me if it went well hey great job on doing this 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 and this to make sure it was a successful investment and so that's really taught me to be able to to, to be a more sophisticated investor based on my previous experience, what I did well and what I did poorly. Dude, I love that. I love that. All right. Back to franchise and the franchisee, franchisor, you know, why you went into the brands or is it, was it the jockey? Was it the horse? Was it a combination? Yeah. So, so I think I would just finish that last thought, which is in real estate, there's real protection on the downside because you own the brick and mortar. It's creating real value. There's cash flow from the rents. And so i like real estate because you're not gonna you don't lose a hundred percent i mean worst case scenario the market goes down you have you know a loss but it's not going to be your entire entire principal investment so that's what's what i've loved about real estate um and that flows right into what we're talking about when you invest in businesses so you invest in real estate a lot of downside protection because a, a land's not going to go to zero a property is not going you know likely not go to zero a business can go to zero or even worse so Keep going, man. Yeah. So, um, it, it, and actually, I'm going to go on a quick tangent. I'll come right back to this one. Hey, we've been going on all kinds of tangents because there's so many things I want to ask you. So, go on another tangent. What, one more thing we're talking about, you know, investments and uh, strategies and whatnot. And this is not financial advice. I got my attorneys make sure I always say that, you know. But one thing that is really important is having a, a, a intention, an intentional asset allocation. Um, a, a, a asset allocation mix. And so for me, whether you have, you know, a hundred thousand to invest or a hundred million to invest, I put 1% of that into cash. 1% goes into precious metals. 5% goes into cryptocurrency. 
5% goes into hard money loans, 10% goes into the stock market, stock equities, 15% goes into private equity, uh, 25% into residential real estate, like fourplexes, et cetera. And then 33% goes into commercial real estate. And it's not exact, but it's pretty close. And so those buckets create diversification, which for me is great because I'm not smart enough to be able to time the markets and figure out when the crypto is going to the moon and when the stock market is going to crash. But all of those are cyclical and I call it an all weather portfolio where I can sleep good at night knowing, hey, I've got exposure to multiple different things. And if crypto goes up, well, stock market might go down and it's all going to work out long term. So I think that's really important to have that again, with intentionality. So it's not just emotionally based when you make those decisions. So, all right, going back to your question, Eric. So um, what drew me to uh, franchises is really, frankly, it's the cash flow. I mean, it's hard to find the type of cash flow you can get from food and beverage and some of these franchises in real estate. You know, real estate is more kind of a, it's like the rat, the tortoise in the hair, right? Like real estate is just slow and steady, super consistent. But I found that uh, these franchises can create incredible cash flow. So that's really what drew me more to that mixed with the fact that I'm huge on what I call experiential investing. And if you go to Axie Partners website on the homepage, it says experiential investing. Everything that I'm doing right now in my life is about experiences and it's about creating experiences. Um, you know, we uh, all the franchises are the, the restaurant brands are very, very experiential. Uh, my partner's. And I just brought in a Top Golf here in the Utah County, uh, multi-year projects, um, huge projects, and I mean, talk about experiential entertainment. It doesn't get any better than Top Golf. Um, you know, our Axie Partners Fund, the only fund I know of where we're so committed to experiences. We do monthly experiential webinars with the top guys in the country. We we do all these. You know, we bring our partners out on these these these, these trips and these summits and events. So it's about creating these experiences. And I do think that experiences are the new economy. I mean, people will pay for experience. They'll pay a premium for experiences. Millennials, you know, baby, what is it called? Baby boomers, you know, Gen Z, people are willing to pay for experiences. And so if you can curate experiences around whatever franchise, whatever investments you're involved with, it gives you a big competitive advantage. And so that's been really fun for me. Um, and uh, so, you know, I invest in a few different things. I've got exposure to, I think, about 62 different restaurants right now. Not brands, but like locations or or whatnot. Not necessarily 62 different restaurant brands, but multiple brands, multiple locations, right? Yeah. Thanks for clarifying that. I think it's uh, six different uh, brands and about 60-something locations right now. And you're, And it's early on in some of those. It's really early on, but an operator that you have a level of relationship and some trust and has a track record. And so for me, it, it, you know what 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 draws me to this to to a franchise model is is mainly the cash flow. Secondly, it'd be the passive nature of, of that. I think passive investing is really exciting. Um, I've been looking for that for a long time in my life because you know at first it was chasing financial freedom which I define as having enough reoccurring passive income to cover your, your family's cost of living. Like that's true financial freedom. But from that point, then the focus actually has turned to time freedom, even more important, like actually having time freedom, right? And then from there, it kind of has turned even more towards lifestyle freedom. And how do you create you know, your dream lifestyle and curate your dream lifestyle with the investments that you've, you've allocated? And I think that franchising can, can be a really good fit to be able to create those different types of freedom in your own life as well. Um, one of the downsides has just been there's not as much tax benefits, at least that I've found, as a passive investor compared to, um, to real. So the only two downsides, I would say, is the tax benefits and then the potential loss uh, isn't as mitigated compared to owning hard assets like, like real estate. And that's why you want to have a diversified portfolio. Um, he mentioned earlier, just kind of having that all weather portfolio. One of the things that you all might want to look at, go to tiger 21, because they kind of have a, a portfolio breakdown of what their, uh, top investors, um, have a lot of these people are there in tiger 21. They've sold businesses for a lot of money. Now they uh, do a lot of passive investing. And so they've kind of curated a bunch of, uh, the fat, the, the members in tiger 21 to do a portfolio breakdown. Dave, do you have another 10 minutes to talk about Axia? Let's do it. All right. So again, I, I'm a, an investor in this with you. 
part of the reason I love, I love the fun. I love what you're doing. Like you said, it's experiential. And I just love some of the projects that you've, uh, that you've been a part of. Um, I love the fact that you've never lost any, uh, investor money in real estate. Um, and, um, and I know you, so those are some of the reasons that I'm involved, um, is not an endorsement, but that's why you're on the podcast because, because we know each other. So, um, talk about, talk about that, uh, uh, Axia Partners, and and uh, give us some insight into that. You bet. So, you know, I, I started out buying all these fourplexes and then started jumping into larger apartment complexes. And from there, I started doing what's called syndications, where we raise capital from my friends and, you know, my network to be able to go take down even bigger and bigger deals. So we did a bunch of big apartment complexes across the country, um, you know, top golf, other uh, development projects, et cetera. And, uh, and then in 2020, you know, I, I, in 19, 2019, I started investing in other funds, real estate funds, and I really fell in love with the fund model, specifically the fact that it Were you mitigates- investing as an LP in those funds or as a GP in those funds? As, a, as an LP, yep. Just just investing into other, um, other you know, local real estate funds, people, sponsors that I look up to that have good character, good resumes. And so- I fell in love with that model because I realized that it mitigates so much downside risk when you have a basket of assets versus investing in one single deal. In fact, the the, the, the data is that there's 2.7 times less risk investing in a United States real estate fund versus in a United States commercial real estate asset by itself. Okay. So because you're investing in one address, right, versus a whole portfolio. And so as I mentioned previously, I'm, I'm really proud of the reputation for never having lost order in real estate. And so I wanted to be able to protect that. And so I decided to go from a syndicator over into a fund manager. It was about two years ago. It's been an incredible journey. We launched our first fund um, about a year and a half ago with a $20 million equity raise, fully subscribed, oversubscribed in a few months. Uh, that one's going really, really well. Which means you had more money that was said, hey, we'll invest this money than what you were planning or had allocated. Correct. Yeah, we hit $21 million within a few months in our attorney, so we had to, we had to cut it off there. So, um, And that's, you know, that, that, that $21 million allows you with leverage to go out and acquire, you know, $50, $60 million of real estate. And so we then launched our second offering last year. It's gone incredible. And we're now in our third offering, which is called the Value Development Fund. And our entire investment thesis is it's investing in recession resilient real estate. And so it's all about asymmetrical risk. And what asymmetrical risk means is it's how do you, you know, protect the downside, uh, you know, risk of loss, but still create strong upside yield for our partners. So our entire approach every day here is how do we not lose and then make sure we win for our partners. And so we only invest in recession resilient assets. So that's multifamily apartment complexes. It's self storage which historically has been the most recession resilient asset to the last two downturns, economic cycles. Uh, and then also RV parks, which are huge on cash flow. And then also we added industrial warehouse to this fund. And the reason why we added industrial warehouse, you know, like Amazon, you know, flex space is because of the shift to e-commerce. And so the majority agree that the next five years, the best returns in real estate will come from industrial warehouse. And so we added that aspect as well. In fact, our first anchor project of this fund is a $50 million industrial warehouse we're building right here in Salt Lake County. Super excited about that, uh, at th that, that opportunity. And so that's how we approach it. Um, the other ways we mitigate the downside risk for our partners besides the asset types is where we invest. And so we only invest in markets that have a really strong net positive migration, meaning a lot of people are moving into those markets. And so, you know, like Wayne Gretzky says, it's not about where the puck is, it's where the puck's going to be. So we love Texas, we love Florida, the Carolinas, uh, Tennessee, Georgia, um, Kansas, Utah, Idaho, Nevada, Arizona. So those are our top markets currently. Um, you know, interesting fact is th those all happen to be red states and it's not a political thing. It's just, you know, a lot of people are moving to those states and also, you know, it's concerning to us if we have to deal with government intervention in the free market cycles with rent control, eviction moratorium, those type of issues that are outside of our control, right? So we really like those red states. And then lastly is every time we do a deal, it's always with a strong value add play. 
what that means is we go and we add strategic value to the asset, right? We're not just buying something and holding onto it. We're coming in, we're adding branding, search and optimization, social media presence, you know, dog parks, um, you know, we work shared office space at, you know, just really amenitizing these assets to make it more valuable for the community. Um, so that's kind of our overall approach. Uh, we're right in the middle of the capital raise for the value development fund and uh, could be more excited about it. You know, a lot of people right now are like, well, Dave, the markets, you know, it's, 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 it's softening and there's a lot of distress in the market. All I'd say to that, Eric, is that's so exciting to us. I mean, we, you know, more, more, more wealth is made in downturns and recessions than any other time. You know, more millionaires are made in economic downturns than any other time in, in U.S. history. And there's some stats as well that even, you know, funds that have launched in the last three decades during economic downturns have been the top performing funds. And so we see that distress as opportunity. And, you know, we're calling, you know, Q3, you know, the rest of this year is a hunting season. So right now it's just taking subscription documents to have this dry powder to get really aggressive here in the next few quarters. And so can be more excited about it. And uh, that's what we're doing over here at Axit. One, one last thing I just want to share. Um, and I share this, you know, for those that are maybe in, in different industries, I talked about experiences and how important that is to me. So we're committed to experiential investing. And what that really means is instead of just focusing on an ROI, a return on investment, we really try to make sure we get an ROE. And that's a return on experience or return on education. And so every month we do these, you know, one hour webinars, the top guys in the country, just teaching um, and Q&A sessions. Every time we close on a, on a deal, we do a one hour webinar and we show you how we found the deal, the underwriting model, how we source the debt, the business plan, just full transparency. And I don't know of any other investment funds out there that are that committed to transparency and over communication. We really pull back the curtain and we show you how we do what we do. And it's been received really well. You know, I think a lot of people want to be doing bigger commercial deals. They just lack the confidence or the competence, competency to be able to do it on their own. And so, uh, and, and last thing I'll say, you know, when I, when I, when I retired from this door to door sales leadership career, I went into real estate, I found myself just looking at spreadsheets and underwriting and, you know, which I like, but I miss the human aspect of it, the interpersonal development and the leadership creation. And so this was kind of my, my approach of being able to, to mix that, you know, that development and that human aspect into a real estate firm. And so anyway, it's been really fun. So sorry to kind of brag about that, but that's been really fun for me to be able to, uh, you know, what, what, one of my goals in life is to be able to create direct value for 10 million people and to help at least 1,000 people become financially independent through real estate. And so it's kind of a way to be able to, to do that at a, at a larger scale. So um, why did you give the tribe of investors, uh, lifestyle investors, why did we get preferred terms? Because a lot of people in the, ma they, they're like, why would I join your mastermind? You know, and, and we got preferred terms with uh with axia partners and there's reasons why and i'm sure other people get different types of preferred terms but um there's a lot of investors that that are part of these masterminds with justin and i um so give give the listeners an insight into why uh a fund might give others or other groups preferred terms that you know if you, someone came in with a hundred or two hundred fifty thousand dollars themselves they would not get those terms or may not get those terms Eric, the answer is simple. I love you and Justin. It's, it's as simple. You guys are good friends. And, uh, <laughs> All right. All class that, done. That done. Easy, easy answer. No, that, that's, that's part of it. But the other part is, um, you know, it, it's because it, we, we put a hurdle or a, a certain threshold where, you know, if the group's coming in for, you know, X amount of capital, then we're able to give it prefer, preferred terms uh, in, in exchange for the larger threshold, right, or, the, or that hurdle. And so, which is beneficial for, you know, our fund as well. Right. So, so that's probably the, 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 the most straightforward answer is, you know, the power of a mastermind is really, it's that synergy, it's the collaboration of people coming together and creating value for each other. And so in the spirit of that mastermind and that, uh, that, that group collaboration, you know, I think it only made sense to be able to offer that to your group. And we don't do it often, uh, frankly speaking. And, Honestly, the thresholds that I set for you guys, I didn't think that you were able, you're going to be able to hit the, the, the highest ones, but you guys 
smoked that and actually more than, I think almost more than doubled the highest, you know, the, the, the hurdle that we, we put out there for you guys. So congratulations on that. Um, and the second answer is simply, you know, we are a relatively young investment firm. You know, we want working towards becoming a multi-billion dollar firm in the next few years. And so right now it's all about spring our investors first, making sure they win so that we get more and more repeat investors in the future. And, um, you know, as an example of that, we're giving 100% of the tax benefits as a pass through to our partners. Usually the sponsors would take a portion of that. We're giving 100% to, our, to our, uh, our investors. So anyway, just putting investors first. And, you know, for us, it's all about the long, the long game here. You know, we want to, we're just getting started and uh, we want to make a real dent in the universe and, and uh, create a lot of value for a lot of people. So. Well, that is as transparent as it gets everyone like that. There's transparency there. So you can take that to the bank. How do people find out about Axia? Jump on axiapartners.com or I, I post a lot about it on my socials. Again, it's Dave Allred. Um, and email is dave at axiapartners.com. Brother, it's so fun having you on. I know uh, we're both running up against a deadline here. So uh, thanks for coming on, talking about franchising, investing, and family and just uh having the amazing uh lifestyle that you have and i hopefully it inspires others appreciate you thanks for having me on eric much love thanks for listening to the franchise secrets podcast links to everything can be found over at franchisesecrets.com and if you want my help with anything from starting your own franchise to join your current franchise business please visit scalablefranchise.com <laughs>